Good afternoon, I'm Norman Wahlberger, and today we're going to talk about uh, projective geometry. It's the eighth lecture in this course in the history of mathematics. So projective geometry really begins in the 1600s with the work of Gerard Desargues, a French mathematician and engineer who realized that there was an alternate kind of geometry that only involved a straight edge. So this is in some sense the simplest of all possible geometries. It's the geometry of the straight edge. There is a, an earlier work in this direction, uh, in particular Pappus, back in 300 AD, proved an important theorem. And that theorem goes like this that we've already talked about. Let's just write it down again. So you have three points on a line, let's say A1, uh, A2, A3, and another three points on another line, B1, B2, and B3. And then we can create some additional intersections by joining these points sort of oppositely. So that point there, we might call that a C3. And joining A2 and B3 and A3 and B2, we get another point. We might call that one C1. And if you join the ones and the threes, C1, B3, A1, B3, and A3, B1, and those two lines also meet. And the point we might call C2. And maybe it doesn't look too much like it now, but these three points are collinear. That was Pappus's theorem, and let's just write down a, a way of representing that. So we'll often use this convention in projective geometry that if we have two points, A and B, then the line determined by them is the line, we'll just write AB. And another convention is that if we have two lines, say L and M, then the point of intersection, we'll call that L times M. So for lines, the product of lines is the point of intersection, or the meet. While for points, the product represents the, the line formed by them or the join. Two basic operations that you can do with points and lines. So then using this notation, here is the theorem of Pappus that if A1, A2, and A3 are collinear, and B1, B2, B3 are collinear, then these three points are collinear. What are they? C1 is the meet of A2, B3 with A3, B2. And C2 is the meet of A1, B3 with A3, B1. And C3 is the meet of A1, B2 with A2, B1. Then these three points are also collinear. So that's a very famous uh, theorem that goes back to antiquity, back to the ancient Greeks. And that's in some sense really the first theorem in projective geometry. It also turns out to be probably the most important theorem in projective geometry. I've often thought that if you're ever captured by aliens and you want to convince them that you have intelligence and that you're not speaking their language and you want to convey to them somehow that you're an intelligent person, um, I, I think this is a good place to start. Draw some lines, 
draw three points here, three points here, draw the lines and, and, and say and you know indicate this. So immediately they know ah you you know Pappus's theorem. Um, we we're not going to roast you and eat you for for dinner. We'll we'll talk with you instead. Okay. It's a, an elementary theorem. It only involves straight edges, straight lines, and uh, no measurement really in, in involved. And that's the nature of projective geometry. This is the, the geometry that Desargue realized was much more than just Pappus's theorem. It's actually a huge and uh, lovely area of geometry that he discovered. I'm going to tell you uh, in a second some of his discoveries, but it's a little bit sad story because his timing was not very good. It was at the same time that Desargue was advocating this projective geometry, Descartes and Fermat were introducing Cartesian geometry, and that caught everybody's attention. And with the development of calculus a little bit later, uh, all, the, all the thinking was in the direction of calculus and, project, and uh, Cartesian geometry. So this kind of languished and most of Desargues contemporaries didn't really understand what he was uh, talking about. There was one or two uh, important exceptions. Pascal also lived around the 1600s, very uh, brilliant French mathematician, but also a uh, writer, a great writer, and he died very young. But he uh, discovered a, a generalization of Pappus's theorem, which is almost surely the most famous theorem ever discovered by a teenager. So he discovered this only when he was 16 years old and I'm not even sure if we know how he proved it. He, his work on it I think was lost but uh, we know of his work sort of indirectly. So what is Pascal's theorem? Well Pascal's theorem basically says that the same theorem is holding if you have six points on a conic. Okay, so here's a conic which could be, uh, okay, it could be a circle, or an ellipse, or a parabola, a hyperbola. As far as projective geometry goes, they're almost pretty well all the same. And then you have six points on it, and I'll draw the same kind of story there, so let's say A1, A2, A3, and say B1, B2, B3. Well, I'm drawing it this way, but in fact those six points can be anywhere they want to be. Then, in fact, exactly the same result holds. If we join A1 to B2, and A2 to B1, and we get a point of intersection, C3. If we join A2 to B3 and A3 to B2, we get an intersection which we should call C1. And if we join A1 to B3 and A3 to B1, we get another point of intersection which we'll call C2. And then, as you can see, these three points are more or less collinear. So in fact the statement of the theorem is exactly word for word the same as this, except the assumptions are we start with six points A1, A2, A3 and B1, B2, B3 on a conic. And then the same conclusion as for Pappus' theorem. Okay, so these are two of the most important theorems of projective geometry, but there's one more that's actually due to Desargue. I draw the picture for that too. And we'll have all three of them on, on the board. Okay, so here is Desargue's theorem. C1, 
So we have three lines which are meeting at some point, say P. And then we have two triangles. And these two triangles are um, perspective with respect to this point P. So that's the first triangle. And we need another triangle. Maybe we'll go like this. Down to here. And maybe over here. And here. Okay, these are lines. Lines in projective geometry always are extendable, not just line segments. They actually go in different directions. They keep going, so we should probably extend them to make that clear. So let's label these uh, two triangles. So let's say this one is uh, A, 1, B, maybe this one, B, 1, C, 1. And then perspective to it, this one, A, 2, this one, B, 2, this point, C, 2. So you can say that triangle A1, A2, A3 is perspective to triangle B1, B2, B3 uh, via the point P. Okay, if we look at them, then this one lines up with that, this vertex lines up with that one, and this one lines up with that one. Then, the meets of the corresponding sides are collinear. So if we look at A1, B1, and A2, B2, then those points will meet at, well, let's write it uh, C1, or just C. Uh, A1, A2, no, we should write uh, ones and two, so we should probably write three. So C3 for that point. And if we look at uh, C1, B1, and C2, B2, then they meet at this point, which we could call that's ones and twos. So that's, that, that was, hang on, A1, B1, A2, B, okay, that's not really good notation, is it? I think I, I should just call them X, Y, and Z. We'll call this point X. We'll call this point Y. And the third one is the other pair of edges, which is this one and this one. Meeting at this point, let's call that Z. So those two triangles in perspective give us three points of intersection, and the theorem is that those three points are collinear. And it's often stated in the sense that if these two triangles are perspective via P, then they, let me go down here, are perspective via a line, L. So those are the, probably the most famous three theorems in projective geometry. And each one of them is a theorem that really relies mostly on a straight edge. You might say, well, this conic of Pascal's triangle, that was not something that's created with a straight edge. But it turns out that you can create conics in projective geometry 
only using a straight edge, but it requires a little bit of sophistication, but we won't say how that goes. If you're interested in some more uh, details on projective geometry, you might want to have a look at my Wild Trig series. So I think Wild Trig 31 to Wild Trig 41, those YouTube series, they all deal with projective geometry. And one of those, or a couple of them, show you how to construct conics, basically just uh, with a straight edge kind of orientation. So this was the beginnings of the subject in the 1600s. And then something rather unfortunate happened. Uh, because people got so excited in calculus and Cartesian geometry, they basically forgot about, about Desargues. In fact, they never really understood Desargues' uh, thinking. And the subject went through a low period when basically nobody thought about it until the, uh, until the 19th century. So roughly 200 years after Desargues, there was a rebirth of projective geometry in the 19th century. And then it became a really major subject. But people realized that actually this projective geometry was very fundamental and almost an underpinning for almost all other geometries. This is the realization that people eventually came to. That projective geometry was somehow more fundamental than all of the other various geometries that were floating around in the 19th century, including non-Euclidean geometry, hyperbolic geometry, and things like that. So there was a, a subject almost disappeared and then was reborn in the 1800s. And then there were a lot of people who contributed, uh, Mobius, Plucker, uh, Chasselet, Klein, Von Stout, Cayley, and it became a major, a major subject. And that reemergence re of it coincided with a new uh, visualization of it. So there was a new understanding of it. Okay, so to explain the new understanding, I first have to kind of explain how did the, the uh, earlier generations think about what was going on with projective geometry. And for that, we have to go in fact back to the Renaissance artists. So the Renaissance artists were very interested in perspective in how you represent a three-dimensional picture on a plane. So there was this problem of perspective. For example, famous problem that they had is if you had a tiled floor, say a, a floor that was tiled in regular squares, and you were drawing it as part of a, a, a painting, so maybe here's your painting, and you're drawing, and so he, you know, usually you draw a horizon, and there's a tree here, and you know, maybe there's a you know, building here or something. Okay. And maybe, uh, maybe here where there's a courtyard, and the courtyard has some, some as a tiled, has tiled squares. How do you represent the tiled squares in your picture? You can't go like this. You can't just go, oh, well, there's, there's, the, there's the picture, because that, that, that disobeys uh, the law of perspective, that, that things which are further away in the picture, closer to the horizon, have to be smaller. This is not going to work. What you do is a little, something a little bit different. So, suppose you uh, that was part of your tile. That was one of your tiles in your, in your uh, in your picture, and you want to fill this out to make uh, more tiles. Well, here's eventually what the perspective artists realized that you could do. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw this line and see where it meets the horizon. So this line here is the horizon. It should really be a straight line. Okay. And we're thinking of it being uh, infinitely far away. So this tree actually wouldn't be on the horizon. It would be uh, closer here. This house also wouldn't actually be on the horizon. It would be somewhere over here. The horizon would be far away, where the eye sees the land meeting the sky. OK, so if we imagine these two parallel lines, they are meeting here, and this diagonal meets uh, there, then if you have a, a square lattice like this, then all of these lines are all parallel, and all these lines are parallel, and all the diagonal lines are parallel as well. And one of the rules that the Renaissance artists realize is that when you're representing parallel lines, they should meet on the horizon. So a rule was parallel lines meet on the horizon. I like a railway track. If you want to represent a railway track or you're just looking at some railway tracks, they're spaced out here, but as they go off to, uh, on the infinity, on the horizon, they're actually coming together. They're converging, just like this thing here. Okay, so we all know that if we sort of, well, I'll try to do this uh, correctly here. Um, that dot would be a diagonal. Also have to go to the same point. And then this would be like that. And we draw another diagonal here. So by using diagonals and I shouldn't draw these at first. By using diagonals, we can sort of fill in this picture, just making sure that all the lines that are parallel meet at one point, and all these lines which are parallel meet at another point. So here's be another diagonal. Once we've got that diagonal, then we can create this one here. And then once we've got these two, we can get another diagonal. And then like this. Okay, these lines will actually start getting narrower and narrower. So this uh, is a way of using the fact that parallel lines meet at the horizon to create a, an image of a tiled floor with reasonable perspective. And before the Renaissance artists, people hadn't really appreciated how to draw uh, pictures properly in three-dimensional, representing three-dimensional objects correctly in two-dimensional plane. It was an important skill. And there were some other rules that they realized. So that maybe that was one rule. Parallel lines meet on the horizon. Another rule is that uh, straight lines go to straight lines. Straight lines must be represented in the page by a straight line. take a picture of a straight line, you're still getting a straight line. It might be in a different place. And another rule that goes back to the ancient Greeks, really, is that the image of a conic is also a conic. So if there was some, say, uh, a circle somewhere in the picture that the artist was trying to represent and he had to draw that circle in the page, then that circle would be represented usually by some kind of ellipse. And the ellipse would be drawn in some, some way that would uh, sort of match up with this. There would have to be certain rules about how you could make that ellipse depending on the perspective. So Desargues found that his theory 
and the theory of the Renaissance artists overlapped in an important way. Both of them needed, so both the theorems that Desargues was interested in, like Pappus' theorem and his own theorem and Pascal's theorem, both Desargues and the artists needed to include some new kind of points in the plane. They needed points at infinity. Because the artists needed points at infinity because of the horizon. The horizon was really a, like a line at infinity. But also these theorems of Pappus and Desargues also really required notions of points at infinity to make sense of them. So to give you an example of that, suppose that, suppose that we want to give a counterexample to Pappus' theorem. And the way we're going to do that is by having our points A1, A2, A3 here. And I'm going to arrange that B1 is here and B2 is here. And I can put B3 here. Now you remember the first thing that we did? We connect, uh, say, A1 to B2 and A2 to B1, and we find the intersection. Wherever they intersect, that would be the, the point uh, C3. But suppose I cook these points up in such a way that these two lines are parallel. So they're purposefully not meeting. So where is this intersection point that, we're, that we've been calling C3? Well, it's up there, sort of infinitely far. Because these two parallel lines meet at infinity in some sense. What about the other uh, intersections? They would maybe work. So A2, B3, and A3, uh, B2. Oops, there we go. That, that point would still be around. And the other one was uh, A1, B3, and A3, B1. So that one's also around. And what does... Pappus theorem say, it says that those three points should be collinear. So this point, this point, and this point ought to be collinear. Well, there's only one line that goes through these two points. It's this one here. So what ends up happening is that these three points actually are collinear in the sense that this line here, this red one, ends up being parallel to the two blue lines. And so it meets the two blue lines at infinity at this point C3. This is the statement of uh, Pappus's theorem in a, sort of a special case. But it does require an idea of points at infinity. So Desargue introduced the line at infinity, which was also motivated by what the, the artists were doing. And here's what he said. Okay, we'll just, there's our ordinary plane. The usual plane. And we're going to add a line at infinity, which you can almost kind of think of as a, as a circle. It's a new line. The line at infinity. And this new line has the property that for every family of parallel lines, so if I choose one family of parallel lines in the plane, there is one point at infinity where they're all supposedly meeting. And if I choose another family of parallel lines, maybe these ones, then there's another point at infinity where they're all meeting. So in this way, every family of parallel lines meet at a new point 
at infinity. And this ordinary plane plus this new line at infinity, that was called the projective plane. And that's the realm in which projective geometry takes place. So projective geometry really is about the plane plus some strange, fictitious line at infinity, which is just what we need so that now every two lines meet. Okay, now we can say that in this context, any two lines meet whether they're parallel or not. Two ordinary, ordinary lines just meet in the ordinary way, but if they happen to be parallel, then they meet at infinity. So now, any two lines meet at a point and any two points join to make a line. And this way the points and the lines become very uh, symmetrical. The points and the lines become almost uh, the same or almost interchangeable. So we get a kind of a duality between points and lines. Yes? How, how can the two parallel lines meet? Well, they don't meet in the ordinary plane, but we can just pretend that we're adding a new line to the plane, and we're insisting that that new line have points on it, one point for every family of parallel lines. So we're adding a, a new line, and we're saying that this red point is on all these parallel red lines, this blue point is all on all those blue parallel lines. That purple point would be the, on all the pur purple lines in some other direction. I think the, many students would find this a little bit strange. Or it sounds a little bit underhanded or something you're a little bit cheating. What, what does this line at infinity? It's almost mystical. And no doubt lots of uh, the mathematicians around Desargues time also thought the same. And this probably contributes to why this subject didn't take off, because there was a kind of uh, ambiguity about this, these points at infinity. Okay. But it turns out that in the, 18, in the 1800s, when the, the subject was reborn, people figured out what the line at infinity really was. And they, they figured out a very simple and elegant way of understanding it, which is completely concrete. I'll tell you about that in a little while, but before I do that, I want to show you some pictures of curves um, that, that you're familiar with in, in a new point of view. So what we're really doing when we have a, a picture, let's say we have a, a box with an apple inside it. Okay, I suppose it's just a, a, a wire frame. There's an apple sitting there. Suppose that's a real life object and we're drawing a picture of it. What does it mean to draw a picture? Well, it means that you have an eye and you have a, uh, an easel or maybe a photographic plate these days. Back in the old days, an easel with a, you're drawing a painting or these days a, a photographic plate. And how do, you, how do you use that to make a picture? Well, you just join up from the point of view of your eye, you join up lines from the real object meeting the plane in some point. Okay? And so that line there, well, you would just join it up and you would draw that line there. And then that line there, you would join it up and you would draw another line. So you end up drawing something which is a two-dimensional representation, just like really joining the dots. You're joining the dots 
mentally between the three-dimensional object which is just sitting there and your plane of the easel on which you're, you're painting. Okay, so that's naively what you're doing. So it's really, uh, mathematically, it's you're looking at all the lines which are emanating from this one point to the three-dimensional object and then doing a sort of a cross-section to it. Okay. So now what we can do is we can imagine, well, we could take some pictures. This is taking a picture. We could take some pictures of some familiar things. For example, some curves that we might like. For example, in the Cartesian plane, we could have y equals x squared. There it is there. Okay, and that's, of course, with respect to the usual coordinate grid. 1, 1, minus 1, where you really have lines, parallel lines like this, forming this grid of lines. So suppose that we were on a large infinite plane. There was no trees or houses or anything. We were just on a flat infinite plane. And the only thing that was on this plane was an x and a y axis and maybe these coordinate lines equally spaced. And suppose we could press a button and then suddenly this graph would be illuminated. So suddenly we'd press a button and there in front of us we would see y equals x squared. Okay, you have, this is a thought experiment. Okay, we're on this infinite plane, there's nothing else around us except for us, and we just press this button and now y equals x squared appears. What would it look like? If we actually stepped back and looked at it, what would we see? We wouldn't see this. We would see something else. And this is the kind of picture that the Renaissance artists were interested in. And here is what we would see. There would be the horizon. And here would be the x-axis. And here would be the y-axis. And here would be x equals 1, and x equals minus 1, and x equals 2, and minus 2. And then there would be these lines that would all go towards this point at infinity, because they're all parallel. So like railway tracks, they would all converge here. And the line where y equals 1, the line where y equals 2, the line where y equals 3, these would become closer and closer spaced. Exactly the same way as I drew that tiled floor earlier. Now what would happen if we press the y equals x squared button? Well, 0, 0 is on it, 1, 1 is on it, 2, 4 is on it, 1 minus 1 is on it, minus 2, 4 is on it, 3, 9, where would 3, 9 be? 3 and then 9 would be up here somewhere minus 3, 9, but 4, 16, 4, 16, minus 4, 16. The whole thing would be illuminated and would look like this. That's actually what you would see. If you had a camera, you had your mobile phone, and you just, and you just pressed the button, and there was the, the parabola, and you looked at it, the horizons sort of level with your eyes, you looked at it, you take a picture, and then you come back and show your friends, this is what they would see. The parabola would actually appear as an ellipse. And you're seeing a picture where this line at infinity is really part of the picture. It's an important part of the plane. So this is y equals x squared, looked at like as in real life. What would happen if you um, looked at a, a pra, um, hyperbola in the same way? So we could also look at, say, some hyperbola that have, has asymptotes here, maybe this hyperbola like that. So that's the hyperbola x squared minus y squared equals minus 1. What would that look like if on the same picture? 
Well, its asymptotes would be, there's the line y equals x, there's the line y equals minus x. It goes through the point 0, 1. And then the top branch would be like this. So the hyperbola would look dramatically different from the parabola. Usually when uh, high school students draw these things, it's hard to tell the difference between a parabola and a hyperbola. They kind of look the same. But if you step back from them and actually take a picture of the whole thing, which you could do on an infinite plane, you would see a dramatic difference. You'd see that the parabola was an ellipse and the hyperbola was, well, it's also kind of elliptic shaped, but um, definitely looks different. Actually, as Desargues would have realized, it doesn't look that much different. We've only drawn half of the parabola, half of the hyperbola, right? There's actually another half of the hyperbola behind us. So if you, again, if you imagine uh, that you're sitting here and the half of the hyperbola is in front of you and half of the hyperbola is behind you, when you take your mobile phone and you, pu and, you, and you put it up here and you click it, what you're really doing is you're drawing lines between, well, here's the plane of your mobile phone. You're drawing lines between, uh, you know, say your, your eye, which is right here, and, uh, and the hyperbola and where it intersects the plane of the, your, your photo. But if you do the same thing for the hyperbola branch that's behind you, then those points would also come through the plane and they would end up registering like this. So the branch behind you, if you were able to sort of draw, connect the dots, the other branch of the hyperbola would look like this and the whole thing, if I had drawn it uh, in a decent way, would also look like an ellipse. So basically all the conic sections uh, look the same, projectively. But the ancient Greeks would have said, well wait a minute, we know that, because all the conic sections arise from slicing a cone. And if you slice a cone, let's say with a, a plane that looks like this, to get one conic section, let's say a para, uh, hyperbola like that, then if you look at that hyperbola with your eye right here, and your mobile phone or your camera or your photographic plate, say that plane there, you join all the dots with your eye to the hyperbola, then what you're really doing is you're just looking at the cone. Because if you connect all the, the points on the hyperbola with your line, you're just going to sweep out the cone. And then that cone is going to intersect this particular branch in an ellipse. or something else depending on the relative positions of the planes. But basically the conic view of, of conics that goes back to the ancient Greeks explains this story here. It turns out to be rather interesting to uh, ask the question, well, what does the projective line look like? If you go one, down one dimension, you still end up with a relatively interesting situation. So down one dimension in just one dimension, there's also something called a projective line. And what it is, is an ordinary line, like the real number line or the, the usual number line, plus one more point at infinity. So the projective line is the usual line, let's call it R for now, plus one point at infinity, that's the projective line. 
Now that one point at infinity is kind of attached to this side, or if you keep going out in this direction, you approach the point at infinity. And if you go out in this direction, well, you also meet that same point at infinity. So maybe another way of thinking about this is that it's really like a circle. In some sense, it's like a circle. So there's 0, there's 1, there's minus 1, there's 2, there's minus 2. And you keep going, there's 10 to the 6, and eventually you get to infinity. So if you get very, very big numbers, you eventually get to infinity, and then that rolls over to minus big numbers. So topologically, the projective line is a circle. Now in the 1800s, there was, the subject was reborn, or at least uh, a lot more interest came around to it again. And people finally realized that there was a much simpler way of understanding what was going on with this projective geometry. So a simpler view was discovered. discovered. And that led to projective ge geometry really being uh, a very general and useful subject. So it connected with linear algebra. It connects with algebraic geometry. And it connects with non-Euclidean geometries that were also discovered in the 1900s. And nowadays, when you explain this simpler point of view, it's almost like an anticlimax. You think, oh, that's all there is to it. It's so much simpler than, than it, we thought it, it could be. So what was this simpler point of view? Well, it was really, I guess, the work of Mobius and uh, Plucker. And it's sometimes called homogeneous coordinates. But the basic idea is that the projective line really is what it really is, is not an ordinary line with one point at infinity. That's the wrong way of thinking. The right way of thinking is that it's the space of one dimensional subspaces in two-dimensional space. What does that mean? Well, I'll explain in a second, but I will just let me finish that by saying that similarly, the projective plane turns out to be the space of one-dimensional, well, let me just write one-dimensional subspaces of or in three-dimensional space. This is a key understanding. Let me explain uh, what that is. Okay, so for a projective line, Here's how you should think of the projective line. You start with a two-dimensional space, like ordinary XY space. And you think of one-dimensional subspaces. Okay, that's a little bit of terminology from linear algebra. What does it mean? So it just means, in this case, a line through the origin. That's all what a one-dimensional subspace is. Okay. There's a one-dimensional subspace. i.e., it's just a line through the origin. So the projective line is all the one-dimensional subspaces. So you look at all the one-dimensional subspaces. Uh, 
OK, I'm supposed to sum of them. And let's sort of uh, have a look at, and this one here, that's also important. Let's have a look at these one-dimensional spaces. Let's start with this one here. Let's call it uh, you know, A, OK? And then a little bit further on, we're at B. And then we're at C, and then we're at D, and then we're at E, and then we're at F, and then we're at G, and then we're at H, and then we're at I. This one here, is it J? Well, by the time we get back to here, this subspace is the same as the one we started with. So we really have to, we're really back at A. This one's the same as B, this one's the same as C, this one's the same as D. So topologically, the subspaces are sort of a circle because you can kind of imagine them as uh, identifying them with, with that circle there. And where do you get this original picture of, of the line with one point at infinity? You get that by looking on the y-axis, say at the point 1, and looking at the line y equals 1. All of these subspaces, almost all of them, meet this, this line y equals 1 in one point. So C meets it here, B meets it here, D meets it here, E meets it there. They all meet in, in one spot. So the set of lines is really the same as points on this line here. Almost. Except that there's one line which doesn't meet the blue one. There's one one-dimensional subspace which doesn't meet it, and that's A. Right? A was the horizontal one. This is somehow special with respect to this, this blue line. This one, A, as far as this line is concerned, it's sort of at infinity. Right? How would you get at A? Well, you could just take these lines and, and sort of move the, move the lines down and down and down towards A. At the same time, this point of intersection would move further and further off to infinity. So this horizontal line is sort of playing the role of infinity with respect to the points on this plane here. And there is uh, exactly a corresponding um, fact picture for the projective plane. All right, so let's have a look at the projective plane from this point of view of trying to think of it as one-dimensional subspaces of a three-dimensional space. So we're starting off with a three-dimensional space, usual x, y, and say z-axis. And now we're going to think about all the lines through the origin in this three-dimensional space. All the lines. Okay, so this is sort of like a three-dimensional sea urchin or something, right? All these lines coming out in all different directions. How would, we, how would we organize all these lines? Well, we could do the same kind of thing that we did over there. We could choose a plane, say the z equals 1 plane. So this is the plane, z equals 1. And then most of these lines will come up and meet this plane in a point. The only ones which are not going to come up and meet this plane in a point are the ones which are horizontal. But there's more than just one horizontal line now. There's a whole projective line of lines which are horizontal. So in other words, if we're looking at just the lines which are horizontal, if I draw them in red here, okay, these are all the horizontal lines. Then this picture here of the, all the lines in this two-dimensional plane is exactly like this picture that I had over here, except it's sort of lying flat. So this is the plane z equals zero, the xy plane. So what we see here is that the projective plane, projective plane, which is the same as all lines through the origin, 
through zero in three-dimensional space. That's really the same as an ordinary plane, the plane z equals one, plus a projective line. Plus a projective line. This turns out to be topologically more complicated than, uh, than the uh, projective line. It's a rather interesting two-dimensional surface. It uh, turns out to be a non-orientable two-dimensional surface. Okay, but let me explain this very important idea of homogeneous coordinates that goes along with this picture. Okay, so here we are in three-dimensional space, and if you have any one line, then any point on it or a vector on it is represented by a triple of points. Say that vector is the, the vector x, y, z. Okay. Then any other multiple of it will be just obtained by multiplying by some scalar say lambda times x, y, z. Because we're just talking about all multiples of that vector, so you just allow it to multiply by any scalar. And it's especially interesting to choose that lambda so that the z coordinate is one. Okay, we could do that. The place where it meets, actually meets this plane z equals one, that's special. Uh, I'll draw that over here. That's when the multiple is such that this last coordinate is one. So in other words, the multiple has to be one over z. Whatever z we started with here, if you divide by that z, that's the multiple, then that will get, a, get us up to the plane where z equals one. And then the other two coordinates have to be x over z and y over z. So what we end up getting is that the, the line, the line through x, y, z, sort of has Euclidean coordinates let's write uh, x, capital X equals x over little z and capital Y equals little y over a little z. Those would be the ordinary sort of Cartesian coordinates in this big plane, in this plane z equals one. So we're giving capital X and capital Y, these are the coordinates in this plane z equals one. And this is a way of transferring from three dimensional stuff, which is scale invariant, to two dimensional stuff. But there's a proviso. The proviso is that z does not have to, can't be zero. Because we're obviously not allowed to divide by zero. In the case when z equals zero, well that would just be these ones here. The red ones, the horizontal ones, those are the ones whose z component is zero. So these are the things of the form uh, x, y, zero. Now the reason why this is a lovely thing is because it allows us to go from two-dimensional situations to homogeneous three-dimensional situation. So this is a transference from homogeneous, homogeneous means sort of scale invariant, homogeneous three-dimensional coordinates to ordinary Cartesian uh, two-dimensional coordinates. So going from x, little x, little y, little z to capital X, capital Y. And the way in the 19th century 
geometers use that, this was to analyze curves. So for example, if we have a curve, let's uh, stick with something simple for now, say y equals x squared. Okay. Well, let's first of all rewrite this because this is sort of in the two-dimensional Cartesian framework. We'll think of it rather as capital Y equals capital X squared. Okay. So we'll use capitals now for ordinary two-dimensional Cartesian coordinates and reserve the little variables for this three-dimensional space. Then if you make this substitution into here, what happens? Well, capital Y is Y over Z. Capital X is X over Z, so we have to square that. Multiply by Z squared, and we get X squared equals YZ. That's now a homogeneous equation in three variables. We started with a non-homogeneous equation in two variables. This was non-homogeneous. But here we have homogeneous means that everything is of the same degree in three variables. And this is actually a surface in three-dimensional space. If you plot all the points in three-dimensional space that satisfy x squared equals yz, what are you going to get? Well, here is little x, here is little y, here is little z. If I just make it a little bit simpler and set z equal to 1 to make it simpler to visualize, then I'm essentially recovering the original. If I set z equal to 1, then I get the equation y equals x squared, which in this case, I guess there's our y direction, there's our x direction. So y equals x squared would look like parabola opening up this way. So those are some points, but in fact we can connect all of those points to the origin. So actually whole, whole lines and extending in this direction also. We would take this parabola, connect it to the origin, then you're getting a curve, a, forming a surface. And that's not all the points, however, because we could also get the points where z is equal to zero. If z equals zero, the equation is x squared equals yz, so if z equals zero, it's telling us that x equals zero. And that means that we're in this uh, direction here. And the, probably the best way of visualizing this is to actually use a sphere. So if we actually used a sphere at center of the origin and just focused on where the surface meets the sphere, where it meets the sphere, and then it would cut out something. And what it would cut out is an ellipse. This parabolic part would, be, would, would yield a lot of that, and then there'd be this one extra point sort of down there. So the, the, the homogeneous version of the parabola ends up being represented by a, an ellipse on the surface of the sphere. 
And in this way, the 19th century mathematicians were able to explain or understand the classification of cubic surfaces in a, in a new way. What they did is they said, all right, let's not worry about the, the Cartesian coordinates. Let's go to projective story. Let's do the same kind of thing for a cubic. Actually, this thing would also have an opposite ellipse on the other side, too, because it's all you have to sort of connect it. So if you had some cubic equation, or like you know, y squared equals x cubed minus 3x, or something like that, you could go through the same process. You could try it, and you would get something that, first of all, on the z equals 1 plane, would be some kind of cubic curve. I don't know what it would look like. But then when you intersect it with all these lines through the origin and then graph the intersection on the sphere, then you get something which is very pretty. Okay, well, depends on the cubic, but you might get a, something that looks like Okay, and go over like that and then sort of come down the other side. And then on the, other, on the opposite side of the equator would be symmetrical. Right? It's going to be the same on, on the other side of the equator because it's uh, sort of, an, if there's one point on the curve, then the antipodal point is also on the curve. So cubic curves can now be visualized as curves on the cube, or not on the cube, as curves on the sphere. And they could have this kind of form, or they might have form like well, something like that. While conics are always essentially ellipses. You do any conic, you're always going to get an ellipse. But cubics are, are more um, interesting. And this projective point of view allowed the algebraic geometers to sort of explain Newton's uh, classification. And it was a, a unifying principle that simplified the discussion of curves. OK, so that's a rather quick introduction to a big subject projective geometry, which was in the latter part of the 19th century was a very, very big subject and it would have been taught in, in uh, universities uh, extensively. If a 19th century mathematician came to a university in the modern world, they would be amazed at, at some things. But one of the things that certainly would shock them is the fact that projective geometry is not taught as a standalone course. They would look through our syllabus and say, where are, the, where are your courses on projective geometry? such an important, huge subject. We learn a lot about linear algebra, but unfortunately, just on the other side of linear algebra is this projective linear algebra, which is just as interesting and arguably more, more important and uh, more beautiful. And unfortunately, most undergraduate students, even if they're majoring in mathematics, they don't get a lot of exposure to projective geometry. And that would, that would be astounding to a 19th century mathematician. They, they, they wouldn't believe that. So how, how is that possible? All students in mathematics in the last part of the 1800s would have studied projective geometry. Almost all of them, I think, it's fair to say. So we, we learn something about, uh, about ourselves also by studying the history and comparing what we're doing now with, with what we're doing, what was done earlier. And we could ask ourselves questions like, why are we doing this? Is it just because that's what we do? Or are there actually sound reasons? Other questions. Okay, so next time we're going to uh, shift to this other very important development of the 17th century, which is of course calculus, the introduction of calculus and all the, the various directions that that gave rise to. So that's what we'll do next time. See you then. <laughs>